The Estain of the Rhyrus Empire had twin sisters with excellent abilities. One of them showed great skills while the other was very weak. Naturally, the education of successors went to one child. Nevertheless, the children cared for each other more than anything else because they had no choice but to rely on each other. They lost their parents when they were young, and even their sweet grandparents left them in an accident. At 18 years old, the child who took over the family at a young age had no choice but to move on, believing that it was the right thing to do for them. For her fiancé and her weak, lovely twin sister, she did all of this. However, one day, she caught them in the act of kissing passionately. She was shocked as she glared at them, but they showed no shame. Her fiancé merely smirked as he looked at her. Get out of the house. Her once sweet and loving sister, who always looked at her so fondly, now revealed her true colors as an awful and terrible person. She questioned what she was doing there and told her to get out, as it was not her house anymore. The protagonist exclaimed that it was she who sold all their family's farmland and mines, their enormous fortune, and even the house with memories. She sold it all. Her sister commented that it was time to thank her for all her hard work. Everything went well because she just needed to pretend to be her. I am your twin. It was easy, she said. To make it worse, she even took her fiancé away. She questioned how she could do this to her own sister. Suddenly, her sister kissed her fiancé right in front of her, smirking and glaring at her. Accepting her defeat, she walked away, her legs slightly shaking as she wondered why. Why did she do all this? She couldn't even ask since when did her sister hated her that much. When she took over her family, many people tried to make a fortune out of her and looked down on her, who was about to become an adult. In the changing times, even though she was an aristocrat, there were hardships because she traded with commoners without hesitation. Even if it was a thorny path, she did her best to protect their memories and was recognized. Her weak and lovely twin sister was her thorn. At that moment, she slipped, falling to her knees. What did she want to hear? That she did that much for what? If it wasn't wrong, if it wasn't a mistake, they would have the right answer. Everything would be fine because they were twins, because she's her sister and her sister is her. That's what she believed. However, now she sees Urge's true colors. Then she remembered when they were very young. Her grandpa told her that the door before her would give the desperate a chance. So, when her parents died, he tried and failed, but if she wished to open the door, it must be because she cannot stand it. She slowly approaches the door and apologizes to her grandpa since she couldn't protect herself. She must be very distressed and having a hard time now, but now she needs help. However, she hesitates to open the door as she tries to remember her sister and her fiancé who mocked her. With trembling hands, she declares that if anything is there, please open the door. She cries with hope in her eyes, wanting to see what her grandpa told her about. Wake her up from this nightmare. At that moment, the door begins to open and a bright light surrounds her. A warm breeze and the scent of fresh flowers fill her nostrils. At that moment, a man calls for her. He has a friendly touch and a gentle whisper. She missed it so much that she felt like she was going to cry. Suddenly he tells her to wake up or a wolf will take her. She then realized that it was her grandpa. Her grandpa tells her that they're at Poral Hill. She questions if this is heaven and if he was waiting for her. He nervously inquires what she was talking about. He pats her on the head, saying that she must be dazed because she just woke up. At that moment, she remembered when the door opened and she asked Grandpa to wake her up. She could barely believe it, but he inquired if she had a happy dream. Her Grandpa tells her that they have to go now, or she will catch a cold. The sun begins to set, and a dog approaches her, licking her cheek. Her Grandpa tells her to hurry up. She believes that if this is a dream, then will there be any happier dreams? It used to be dreary when everyone left, but now everyone is here and lively as they were before, even Uncle Robert and Misha. This is not a dream. She's really back. Next to her grandfather's table, reading the documents together. When she was a child, even these normal documents, she always asked her grandfather to help her with it. She thought that those moments would last longer, but her grandfather passed away after a sudden accident. At 20 years old, she became the master of the house. 
She didn't even have time to be sad after her grandfather's death. Now she's back to the past, so no one knows. Her grandfather, seeing her expression, inquired, What's the matter? She's been so quiet. She's usually talkative. She tells him that it's nothing special and she's just thinking nonsense. But not too long later, she informs him that she had a nightmare. In the nightmare, she was betrayed by the one she believed in the most. She couldn't even fulfill the last will of someone important to her. She cried for a moment, but he wiped her tears away and told her that it's good that she woke up now. He would do all the work today so she should take a rest. Their visitor will soon come, so she should do her makeup again, and she has to go meet her sister. She realizes that this is not the time to be sad. If she's really back, she has to find out since when her sister had that thought. When did she hate her? She takes a deep breath as she stands at her door. Suddenly, she knocks on the door, and her sister tells her to enter. Her sister smiles at her, seemingly happy that she's arrived. Lorencia comments that it's so cold, trying to start a small conversation, but her sister replies that she is fine. On the contrary, she's the one that is tired. Her sister's smile fooled not only her but everyone in the household. Is she lying or telling the truth? Her sister questions what happened today. Lorencia informs her that nothing special happened today. As always, Urja's eyes seem to hide a hint of hatred as she exclaims, As always, she smirks, stating that she heard there would be a visitor, as she had said they would have a guest today. The guest is said to be a great man. She declares to her sister that she's really proud. Suddenly, Lorencia senses dread from her. She begins walking away, declaring that she doesn't remember anything about a visitor. Before she leaves, she tells her sister that she will have lunch alone today, and she will prepare it for her. Her sister agrees, seemingly a bit surprised by her abnormal attitude. Lorencia cannot face her sister. Meeting a disgusting person and signing a contract is even easier than meeting her sister. From now on, she won't believe in her anymore. The good memories of the past have already broken in her soul. The moment she saw her, she wanted to ask since when, why, and what for. After coming back to the past, she can't answer that. There is no way but to find out the answer herself. Suddenly, she hears low voices from outside the window. She then realized that everyone had been busy. She heard that they would have a visitor, but who is it? She decides to check it out. When she was so young, there was nothing that could defeat her. She said that so bravely, but now she's so embarrassed because now she meets another traitor, her former fiancé. He notices her and smiles. He approaches her and thanks her for inviting him. On her 17th birthday, this man who said that he loved her who made her trust him for such a long time, is also the man who broke it all in just a blink of an eye. He is Marquis Bellator. He proposes the engagement today. Marquis Bellator is a man who is admired by many people, as well as a man of great ambition. He's not just the young master of the Akpensia family, but also her fiancé. The Akpensia family has the power to control the empire and Estain has a huge sum of wealth. The union of their families by their engagement was extremely supportive by nobles. A prophecy declared that two Grand Duke families were destined to fall down. In fact, he is a person with great ambition and ability, so she thinks it's okay to delay getting married once or twice. Honestly, she thought he was trustworthy at the time, but when he first met her, he told her to get married to him and he would give her a ring. But on their second meeting, which is today, things will be different if he greets her declaring that he's honored to have been invited by Lorencia. He gives her blue roses. This blue rose is made from alchemy. He was thinking a lot about what gift to give, then decided to bring this flower because he thinks this beautiful blue rose suits her very well. But he also says that, unfortunately, it cannot compare to her beauty. She does not think that he is very sincere. Suddenly, her grandfather intervenes and questions if he brought a present for him. Seeing that he only takes care of his niece makes him a little jealous. Marquis Bellator declares that, of course, he brought a present for the Viscount. Suddenly, Urja appears and greets the Marquis. Marquis Berlt states that he heard she wasn't feeling well, yet she still came out to greet him. He has also prepared a gift for her, red roses, as they suit her, a girl like a shy flower bud. She blushes and thanks him, 
He comments that he heard the Estain family had twins, but unexpectedly, both are so gorgeous. Suddenly, a sense of dread washes over her as she remembers how they kissed so passionately in front of her and stared at her with that disgusting smile. She feels as if she wants to puke. Seeing this, her grandfather rushes to her, worried, but Marquis Burlt, the man who claims he loves her, and her very own sister merely stare at her, their gazes cold and unmoving. Dazed, she enters the bathroom, and someone inquires if she's all right. Her sister is also outside, asking if she's okay. She's sweating and trembling, questioning why she hadn't seen this until now. She exits the bathroom and says that, because she's not feeling well, she wants to go back to her room first. Her grandfather tells her to go back to her room, wearing a worried expression. He informs her that Marcia will bring her medicine later. Behind him, her sister inquires again if she is fine. She smiles and exclaims, Of course, don't worry. You should just have a great time. Because she went back to the past. She knew what would happen just now. The dark night is surrounding her. All around her is loneliness. She was really betrayed by those two. Whatever happened really started this early. And it's making her very angry. But she can't say for sure if it did. Right now, she will try to do what she can. The first priority is eliminating those two, and to do that, a plan must be made. Suddenly, her grandfather enters the room, worried. Seeing that she's awake, he seems happy. She explains that she's awake because she heard something, and it woke her up. He informs her that he didn't know, so he didn't knock on the door before entering her room. He apologizes, but since he thought she would be hungry, he went to buy the apple pie that she likes to eat. He comments that it would have been better if the three of them had eaten together for the first time in a long time. He apologizes again, declaring that he didn't know she was sick, but she tells him that she's fine. It's not his fault. Her grandpa is certainly a gentleman. Suddenly, he informs her that before the Marquis left, he met him to talk in private. He tells her that the Marquis wants to have a serious relationship with her on the premise of marriage, an engagement as expected. Even though she tried to avoid it, she still can't escape destiny. However, she still tries to fight it. Suddenly, her grandpa places his hand on hers, stating that he doesn't want to make her live her life by his way. He told Marquis Barilt to ask for her permission, although he thinks Barilt is a nice man, but he doesn't know what she thinks. Suddenly, she declares, irritated, that she hates him. He is surprised but states that if that's the case, there is nothing he can do, but he lets her know that Burlt is not a man who can easily accept her rejection at once. She tells him that she knows he's even a horrible man. Suddenly, her grandfather shows her an invitation card sent to her. She takes the card and wonders what this invitation card is about. Suddenly, she realizes that long after she accepted the marriage proposal, someone openly organized a noble party. One after two great duke families, the emperor's cousin was famous for his debauchery. This is the invitation card from the Grand Duke Bertian. Maybe she should refuse like the last time. Finally, she realizes that at this party, Burlt will also come, so she decides to go. Later that night, she sits at her table and writes on paper that perhaps Burlt was aiming for their family's fortune from the beginning. Of course, she doesn't discredit Akfensia's family's authority, but he intended to devour her family from the start. She has to end her engagement with him. However, this isn't her style, but she can only try. A few days later at Bertie and Duchy, she is dressed beautifully in a light blue and white dress. It's been a while since she's attended a party, and it feels quite different from before. Suddenly, someone calls out to her, and she believes that something is coming. Barilt comments that she looks beautiful today. He smiles warmly, stating that she didn't look well the last time he saw her but now she seems much better. She dismissively responds, SOSO, which makes him nervous. He declares that she is quite gorgeous. Suddenly, he grabs her hand and requests that they have a dance. She would love to reject it, but the power gap between their two families is enormous. Ignoring his request would be insane. However, standing in front of aristocrats who enjoy gossiping about others, she has to express her attitude clearly. She can feel their gazes, cold eyes staring at her. She exclaims, Dear Marquis, 
I am deeply troubled by these actions of yours. As the head of the noble Marquis of Ryrus Empire, I'm sure you will sympathize with my stance. She thinks if the head of the famous Marquis family is disgraced by the daughter of a Viscount family, he wouldn't be able to show his face in front of others. He is flabbergasted, but she tells him that she will dismiss herself. Because of this incident, soon word of this will spread among the nobles, and they'll say that the cheeky Viscount's young lady doesn't even know her position. However, she's used to it. Compared to the gossip she heard when she first became the head of the household, this is quite tame. The legacy of the Azatine family also does business with commoners. They thought it was just speculation as their family was financially capable in the first place, but these nobles believe that although they're nobles, they're lowering the other nobility. Calculating profit and loss, it wasn't difficult to find the answer. What about dealing with people? She can't get used to it no matter how much time passes. Suddenly, she notices someone. He's a blonde man with crimson eyes holding a wine glass in his hand. He is Grand Duke Bert. The nobles who like to talk behind people's backs have more to talk about him than about her. He is the rarest in the empire, possessing vast plains and greeneries under the protection of the two duke families. One of them was the Bertani Duke family, a prestigious military family that produces the commander of the guards and general corps. However, recently, she heard there were some problems. It's because the current head of the household, Ian, is wayward. Of course, there has never been any marriage proposal to him because of the rumors that he is into sodomy. However, he has never addressed this rumor. She was ostracized from society just because she was doing business with commoners. There are many people who are religiously repulsed by sodomy. She doesn't know if it's true, but she knows he must be tired. But since he's the duke, he'll be okay. However, he doesn't look like he's the type. Suddenly, she notices he is glancing at her. This makes her upset, and she begins walking away. Late at night, in the garden, she walks alone. She wonders if this much rejection is not enough. To get rid of Barilt, she needs someone to accept her marriage, even superficially. However, in the other duchies, there are daughters, and they are wide age gaps. Suddenly, someone calls her name. It is her former fiancé. He orders her to wait for him. He grabs her hand with such force that she is in pain. He orders her to respond to the proposal and then he lets her go. Suddenly a hand grabs his. Ian inquires what he is doing in someone else's garden. He doesn't seem like a pretty sight. She wonders why Grand Duke Bertian is here. Her former fiancé quickly releases her and nervously declares that the Duke Bertian seems to have some misunderstanding. They're in a deep relationship. Their engagement is coming. Right now, Lorencia is glaring at him for a while. Ian questions if this is a lover's fight, but Lorencia is angry because she knows that's ridiculous. However, without shame, Barilt states that she also has a heart for him. She can't believe that she once liked and trusted this garbage as if he knew how she feels. She wonders if she really has to put up with this rude behavior in this life. Suddenly, she kicks him. This makes him furious, and he attempts to slap her. His eyes his just like insects. This is who he really is. Unfortunately, she realized too late. However, he has forgotten that he is in the presence of the Duke. Ian declares that he is younger than him, so he'll just call him Burlt. Hearing his voice, Burlt freezes in his tracks. Ian questions if he knows the first thing that Imperial Knights are taught. Bert Ian informs him that it's chivalry. Protect the weak and be loyal to the country. This is the pride and honor of a knight. This behavior right now, Ian doesn't think it's the honor of a knight. He smiles and tells him that he wants him out of his garden. Burlt is flabbergasted and tries to dispute with the duke. However, Ian declares it's an order. Like an injured puppy, he runs away with his tail between his legs. At that moment, Alan extends his hand to her and tells her to make the payment. She responds with a confused yes. He clarifies that he means the price, and she questions his behavior. He seems like her loyal escort dog, patrolling hard whenever she got back. She wonders why he seems to overlap with that situation. Even their hair color is similar. However, she can't pet him. He then declares that her family, which always does business without exception, must understand how valuable this situation is in their eyes. 
She inquires if he knows who she is, and he tells her in many ways. She wonders why he's talking to her like that when they just met. At the party hall, he's quite a gentle and kind person. But in the garden, he's more of a swindler. He tells her to call him Ian, as he doesn't like being called by his title in private. She lowers her head and thanks him, declaring that she owes him. As he said, her family and she are business people, so he should let her know if there's any money he wants. He declares, the more, the better. She wonders to what extent. He raises two fingers and she exclaims, 2,000 gold? However, he clarifies, looking a bit confused, that he wants just two gold coins. She is surprised and questions if that's all he needs. He then inquires if she would give him 2,000 if he asked for it. She explains that she would, but he tells her he's just kidding. He was going to help her anyway because of chivalry. He tells her they should go in, as it's dangerous to go alone. She gives him her hand and thanks him. 